Hello, the internet, and welcome to Open Source Directions, hosted by Quantsight, the webinar that brings you all of the news about the future of your favorite open source projects. My name is Anthony Skopatz, your host for Open Source Directions. Co-hosting with me today is Carol. Hi, listeners. I'm Carol Willing. I'm an active member of the Jupyter and Python communities, and I'm very happy to have an opportunity to chat about Standard Lib today. Um, would you folks like to introduce yourselves? Thank you. Yeah. Hi there. Um, my name is Philip Burkert, and I'm currently a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon University, where I'm working on an e-learning platform. It's called Isle, and the goal of Isle is to make data science accessible to a much larger group of people than currently. And for this project, I'm doing a lot of JavaScript, both on the back end and front end. And I've been working with Node.js since, like, I guess, 2013, and have since then written quite a bit of open source uh, code, most of it for Standard Lib. And hello, I'm Athan Rains. I currently work for Quansight, where my primary focus is development. And I've been active in open source in the Node.js community, at least, since uh, Node.js version 6, which is probably about I don't know, six or seven years ago, and have primarily focused my efforts on bringing numerical and scientific computing capabilities to JavaScript, Node.js, and the web more generally. And I've been a core contributor to Standard Lib for a little over three years now. Excellent. Well, thanks for to both of you for joining us. Uh, and before we dive into Standard Lib and all the fun there, we've got our visualization of the week section. So we're each just going to go around the table here and talk about a visualization that we've been enjoying recently that's been new or, or poignant in the in the news recently. So Athan, I believe you're first up. Cool. Yeah, let me share my screen real quick. There we go. Can we see that? Yep. Awesome. So yeah, I chose a visualization by Nadi Brimmer of Visual Cinnamon, uh, Cinnamon um, which is a great blog for data visualization if you're not familiar with her work. Um, this particular data visualization, which uh, was featured in a New York Times article, and the article covered the kind of insane number of trackers that follow you around as you navigate the internet via your web browser. And the reason why um, this I found this particular data visualization compelling was that it really reinforces once again how little privacy we can expect on today's web and why efforts like Brendan Ike's Brave browser are so important for moving the web forward. And in this visualization, each of these circles um, encapsulates all the various pieces of tracking technology, and then the red connections are um, basically unique tracking IDs that kind of follow you around on the internet. So that's my data visualization. Okay, then my turn, I guess. So let me let me share here my tab. Uh, so I chose one from 538. Uh, they have these uh, presidential approval ratings uh, of the current president. But what I found interesting is that they have this trellis chart here where you have a grid of many small charts and uh, you can compare like how the approval of the respective presidents developed over time. And uh, yeah, especially for a foreigner like me, I found quite interesting to to trace the Kind of developments here and um, be reminded of some of the historical events that happened at any given time there. Um, and as an aside, I also, and a, there's a little, like on a more lighter note, maybe uh, a little, like, nice library for like doing um, visualizations uh, in this style of like these XKCD comics. So I mean, that's <laughs> something you can do now uh, with JavaScript. So that was recently <laughs> released. Yeah. So that those are mine. You know, those are important, those XKCD things. Um, I, in the interest of time, because I know we have a jam-packed um, schedule today, I'm going to say that I have uh, found something called the World Glacier Explorer uh, by the Open Glacier Gl Open Global Glacier Model folks. And um, <laughs> it actually uses my binder and Jupyter. What could be better? And Brandon will put the link in the chat. So do check it out. And Anthony? Yeah, excellent. So for my share today, I would just like to bring up this tweet by David Brochart, um, where there is, he's demonstrating basically a, a vector overlay uh, and selection tool on top of IPy leaflet. So it, it allows you to build and manipulate these vector selections on top of maps. It's really, it's pretty awesome. Uh, and then like right there in a, in a notebook. So yeah, it's a cool visualization. Go check it out. Uh, it's a neat tweet. I think that's 
been released today or yesterday or, or sometime very recently. Um, all right, so now we're going to dive into standard lib. So standard lib is the standard or a standard library rather for JavaScript and Node.js with an emphasis on numerical and scientific computing applications. Uh, the library provides a collection of robust high performance libraries for mathematics, statistics, data processing, streams, and, and other utilities that you would kind of expect to have you know, in your toolbox. Um, it's got about 2,100 stars on GitHub right now. Um, and yeah, it's a really exciting new project in the Node JavaScript ecosystem. So you know, with that, we've just got a few questions for you, uh, yeah. Nathan and Philip. And yeah, Carol, why don't you take, take it away? Uh, why don't I kick it off? And Athen, um, maybe you could share with us why the project was started and what need it fills. Yeah, uh, so the project has a rather long and arduous backstory, but the CliffsNotes version is that we wanted to perform numerical computations in JavaScript, and we really couldn't do so because of a general lack of libraries and frameworks for, for doing so. And on a personal note, you know, my background's in biophysics, where during my PhD, we used uh, MATLAB for data acquisition and analysis. And as I became more involved in the JavaScript community, um, working on data visualizations um, and working for a couple of full stack Node.js shops, I missed having the relatively performant and simple APIs provided by MATLAB and wanted to bring that same performance and design simplicity to the JavaScript world. So little by little, I began writing small functions and eventually libraries to this end. And over time, that collection continued to grow until the present day is now embodying the standard lib. And, so that's my origin story. What about you, Philip? So yeah, well, um, now a couple of years ago, while I was still an, a student at Oxford, I was working there with a political science professor on a project that involved like scraping a lot of data on Twitter. And so we stored that in a MongoDB database. And uh, and then it seemed to me like a natural ex extension to also do analysis in JavaScript because like, the Mongo Apple is in JavaScript. And so you just wanna like do not have that context switch between multiple languages. Um, and then, I yeah, I was rather surprised to see that, um, while well, even back then, right, JavaScript was, by many metrics, probably the most pro uh, popular program language. Um, there wasn't really a lot in terms of uh, scientific computing libraries or things that would support data analysis. And so I had to write stuff on my own and I put it on GitHub. And then at some point, yeah, Ethan reached out and we have been working uh, and joined forces since then. That's excellent. Uh -huh. So are there alternative projects to standard lib out there? Well, perhaps rather obviously, <laughs> you know, numerical and scientific computing libraries and languages are quite prevalent outside of the JavaScript ecosystem. For example, you have NumPy and SciPy, Julia are many of the libraries and languages that people listening to this webinar are probably familiar with. And within JavaScript and its ecosystem, there are also alternative projects um, that usually expose like a limited subset of, of comparable functionality. For example, if you uh, need synchronous utilities, like the most two popular libraries there would be a low dash and its predecessor underscore. Uh, for, for async utilities, there's the async package. There's data visualization, very popular libraries such as D3JS and Vega. Um, and now there's also like neural networks and deep learning in the browser. Yes, for example. And there are also like some statistics libraries such as JSTAT. So there are, there are quite a few libraries to do many things in JavaScript, um, but and that's maybe not too unexpected because the it has the largest uh, package ecosystem of any programming language. However, for uh, many of those numerical and scientific computing applications, the landscape is really highly fragmented. And so there isn't really like a coherent narrative and, uh, and vision. And not one project has really amassed uh, like a dominant mindshare. So that's quite different compared to like, let's say Python. So with Sanatlib, we set out to fix that situation. So um, that's interesting. So what technology is it built upon? Just JavaScript or something else as well? No, in fact, um, the project's built on a mixture of <laughs> JavaScript, WebAssembly, C, C++, and Fortran, um, which is actually quite comparable to what you have Maybe not the JavaScript and WebAssembly, but certainly the C, C++, and Fortran like you have in the uh, Python ecosystem. That's cool. You're using WebAssembly. Very okay. cool. That's neat. I'm excited to hear kind of more about how all, all that works. Uh, <laughs> and so who started the standard lib project, or when would you say it started? 
I guess it was like April, like the GitHub first comment was in April 2016 and uh, started as a joint effort uh, by Effen and myself. Um, we had done some preliminary work before, but that's kind of when we really settled on like a structure and, um, and the scope of the library that we believed in. And beyond the two of you, are there other folks that maintain the library as well? So it's primarily the two of us, but we do have help from periodic contributors and other members of the con community who uh, contribute code or documentation, file issues, and we always appreciate that, obviously. And the users probably too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so speaking of the users, where do the standard lib users come from and, and where do the standard lib con contributors come from as well? So we found that many users uh, spring from one of two places. So first is people like who need to do like web-based data visualization, but also want to perform like data transformations and analysis mm -hmm. alongside those exporter visualization components. And they want to do it within a client application without the need to have a separate remote backend for performing the computations remotely. Um, and then secondly, we have like e-learning platforms for statistics and data science mm -hmm. where like computational load to the edge, so to speak, um, to the client, that allows certain cost advantages because we do not have to maintain like and scale like large cloud-based infrastructures. And in general, uh, I would say that users are often concerned about uh, things like data privacy, data and computational locality, as Philip mentioned. There's also advantages such as offline availability. And you do get some performance advantages by way of minimizing network latency, which you really don't get, let's say, in a Jupyter ecosystem where you have a client-server relationship. So, for example, if you have a web-based client application, and that can also perform computational tasks, then user data can be uploaded but never has to be sent to a remote server. And that particular setup better preserves data privacy. It allows a web application to continue working offline. And then it also reduces network latency to effectively zero because remote procedure calls are pretty much unnecessary. Very cool. I'm assuming that's where the WebAssembly all came in. Um, well, certainly, yeah, WebAssembly helps to speed yeah. things up. Yeah. So is the project participating in any diversity and inclusion efforts? Well, it's a relatively young project. Uh, I would say we have yet to host any explicit events aimed at increasing diversity and inclusion. However, we have implemented um, a code of conduct and we actively enforce policies to ensure that the project provides a welcoming environment to anyone regardless of their race, gender, orientation, or other affiliation. That's fantastic. Yeah, excellent. Well, why don't we see some of this in action? I believe you have a few demos for us to to C standard lib and I'm pretty excited to to see what's what it what's going on. So if you want to bring up either of those, I guess uh Athen, are you first up here for a demo? Well we do have four brief demos. Uh, fingers crossed everything goes well. But uh Philip, you wanna kick things off? Yes, so um I would give a first a brief overview of the library and let me preface this by like mentioning like one of the core features of it, which is like decomposability. Uh -huh. So uh, we really want to make sure that uh, the project can is comprised of these independent, individual independent composable units that can be consumed independently of the rest of the project. And that's obviously like quite important in web development contexts where we really need to like ensure that the application size is as small as possible. You do not want to send over the wire like a lot of like a large library, right? Right. And so that's kind of the core of it. And um, so we have all these like individual packages, basically. And here uh, I have pulled up the docs uh, that we have, and we can browse some of the overall namespaces that contain a lot of different functionalities. So with utility functions here, we have like a lot of like uh, assertion utilities, we have um, math functions, we have statistics, uh, we have like string utilities, random number generators, etc. So and we can also um, drill down here a bit. So for example, here we have the, our random number generators, and we do have um, like here all the common statistical distribution mm. uh, distributions in the base um, namespace here. Uh, those are all seedable. So if you care about reproducibility, like as you should in, in like scientific <laughs> applications, uh, you can do that in, in contrast to like the math random native uh, JavaScript uh, PNG. Um, but besides the base implementation, we have also like, for example, here iterators for um, our random number generators, then you can iterate over a sequence of numbers. And we have also like uh, streams packages. And those streams packages allow one to use, let's say, Node.js streams. Um, 
Now let's go one uh, more level down and look at an individual package and what uh, is comprised about, uh, in there. So let me search for one of those functions. We have a little search box here. So we have here the error function. The error function is like kind of used in quite a few statistical functions and distributions. Um, and here we have like the documentation. We can go to the, the source code here. So I hope you can see that. Um, so here now we are in GitHub repository. We have, we have the documentation. Uh, each package also has like obviously the source code, which is like fully um, annotated with like implementation details here. We have like um, JS doc comments, like um, so you can really uh, have a look at the underlying implementations there. Um, we do have like example code that one can uh, run to get familiarized with the APIs. We also have um, like unit tests where we strive to have like 100% code coverage. Um, and uh, associated benchmarks. And those benchmarks are often like either to um, for other JavaScript implementations so that you can compare their performance, but also cross language. So here we have, for example, like benchmarks for against Python, Julia, C and C++. And for like dynamically um, interpreted language, like JavaScript is, is pretty fast. So that's, uh, that's always encouraging. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of lot there that um, that we have for these individual packages. We also have like TypeScript declarations now. Um, and we have like for some of those modules, we have CLI tools uh, so that you can actually use it in the command line. And then for example, like pipe the results of one of the random numbers just into your favorite, uh, favorite Unix utilities. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. um, so let's move on to the next demo, um, which I think will be me this time. Let me shut off that here. Show my screen. Let's go down the screen. Cool. All right. Uh, can we see my terminal? Yep. Yep. Awesome. So uh, I think the next demo I'll show is uh, that we've also worked on including a REPL and a standard lib. Um, the Node.js REPL is pretty bare bones, but we decided to go ahead and extend that out, supercharge it with a lot of the functionality that we've been working on. Um, and for those people that are familiar with Python, we provided a IPython-like REPL experience. The input and output prompts um, obviously should look quite familiar. Um, I suppose another thing which is kind of nice about the REPL that maybe distinguishes a little bit is we have this notion of workspaces. Um, so if we look at the current workspace, we're in something called base, um, but I can easily create a new workspace. Let's call it foo. And if we look at the variables in this workspace, currently we don't have anything, um, but as soon as I declare a variable um, and I look at that, now I have a certain variable to declare in workspace, kind of to be expected. But let's say I want to, let's say I'm doing some analysis and I have some like parameters and I want to have like kind of like a clean slate um, I can create a new workspace, let's call it bar. And if I look at the variables currently in that workspace, there's nothing existing. So whereas I declared X before, X is no longer defined. And if I now uh, set X to something else, like for example, one, and then I switch back to foo, and X, now I've reloaded that workspace. So this is quite nice because you can, when you're doing interactive data analysis, you can switch back and forth between different workspaces all within your within your REPL. And I guess like the one other thing I'll, I'll show is that the REPL comes with built-in tutorials through a uh, ASCII-based presentation um, framework. So you can actually go in, there's a tutorial on how to use the REPL um, that you can kind of advance as you go through it. Um, I guess one thing I'll show as we skip forward to uh, later in the presentation is I can show you how we can do plotting within the terminal. Um, so what's kind of nice about this is that uh, you can run the code directly from the slide. So what's going to happen in this particular slide is I'm going to create some X and Y data for plotting. And I can just do run slide. That's loaded X and Y into the terminal. And now if we go to our next slide, I can generate a plot. And I'll do that just by doing run slide. And this is gonna open up an electron window with the, uh, the plot showing. And what's nice about the plot functionality that we have is you can render to an electron window or within a browser application or even to ASCII. Have you, so, um, yeah. so for, uh, there are some terminals that let you even 
uh, display and line. Do you support those, like iTerm2 and, and things like that? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we have both ASCII plotting capabilities. If you have a terminal that understands, let's say, SVG or something like this and, and can translate it over or can you actually render PNG inline, yeah. then, yeah, you'd be able to do that directly in the terminal. Okay, cool. Um, all right. And then let's go to the next demo. I have another one for you. Um, so let me share my screen again. And we'll do it this way. So the next demo is a um, fun little hack I did with Jupyter. So for all those Jupyter fans out there, um, I created an in-browser uh, standard lib kernel. Um, so what's nice about this is typically within Jupyter, you need to do, uh, you have like a client's application and then that does some kind of RPC to a remote backend. You can either have that locally or you can have that cloud hosted. And the, as we talked about earlier in terms of the use cases, one of the nice things about doing things in JavaScript is you can do everything client side, so you can push things out to the edge. So um, in this particular repo, um, which is available on the standard lib-js uh, organization, um, basically what I do is I intercept all the WebSocket uh, connections that the Jupyter client makes to the Jupyter backend. And um, I mock that, and then I've loaded standard lib in the background such that you can directly run standard lib within Jupyter. Um, so here's a notebook, um, and this is kind of all preloaded, but uh, all the standard lib functionality that you might have just seen in the REPL is all, all already loaded. So if I want to evaluate the error function again for a different value, and I run that, there you go. And this is all happening client side, no servers involved, which is pretty nice. So I think one of the nice things kind of going forward that we'd like to look into is to how to make Jupyter notebooks in the Jupyter environment a little bit more friendly for doing client side only computations. Yeah, I think okay. there's some good Very stuff cool. coming that way already. So um, you're probably well aware of those. So yeah. cool. OK, so we have one last uh, presentation. This is a piece of the e-learning platform that we are developing at, at CMU, IO. And there we have this kind of data exploration tool uh, where students can, without any coding, um, can run whole data analysis workflows. For example, here we have a data set on like science foam discussions from like sciencefoams.net. Uh, and we see here that uh, we have um, these different types of variables. We can browse them, we can have a look at them. And then people can look at plots, they can run statistical tests, et cetera. For example, here we can, let's have a look at whether author experience um, is associated with the number of deleted posts. We can do like plots, we can run statistical tests. And again, all these things are um, carried out in the browser. So there's no um, server interaction here for, for the computations of these tests. So we can serve, like we have hundreds of students every semester now using it in, in, in some capacity. And they write their data analysis reports here on the platform itself. Um, and again, like they don't need a program, we can bring this uh, to really like a diverse audience and scale it up without any any problems, thanks to standard lib under the hood, which allows us to not have like a large server infrastructure there. That's really yeah. neat, yeah. I was playing around with it this morning. It's really slick and, and pretty powerful too. So as a student, um, Man, think about what you could do without having to learn how to code. Um, really pretty awesome. And there's certainly like a large range of people, right? Like data is now everywhere. And like, I uh, really want to equip people from all disciplines of how they can think about data. And um, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, really, really interesting. Very neat to see. Um, oops, okay. So, uh, are there any other demos you'd like to share? I think we have a couple minutes or... Uh, I, I think that kind of wraps it up. I think if you want to move on to the roadmap, if you want. Yeah, let's do it. Let's let's move on to the roadmap section. So at this point, you know, we're talking now about where Standard Lib is going, what the future of the project is, rather than um, kind of what Standard Lib is. And these are all places that the project sees as... Um, venues for which contributions are welcome, either in terms of, you know, code contributions or funding if you happen to have deeper pockets. So um, funding is always appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just keep that in mind while we have this roadmap discussion that these are these are fundable or con contribution welcome places because the product because Samuel Lib is already 
thinking about doing them. So um, okay. yeah, so take it away in terms of cool. what's first on the roadmap. Yeah, let me pull up the roadmap. You, you have Thanks, Evan, for doing. So we have a roadmap document in the GitHub repository as well that we uh, will update as we go along. And the first uh, piece there is, um, uh, do you want to? Yeah. No, there you go. So the first piece there that we have is multidimensional arrays. Um, <laughs> so in general, that's like, they are used in all of scientific computing, uh, most often maybe in form of matrices, but also like higher order tensors. And um, yeah, natively JavaScript doesn't offer like a such a data type, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, the naive approach people do in JavaScript is just to use an array of arrays, uh, which is nice for like the how to index into it, like how to the semantics of that, but it's like computationally super inefficient. Mm -hmm. right. um, so one really needs to have like a custom NDOA data type for any type of serious um, data processing. And um, building on the lessons of some earlier work in the JavaScript community by folks like Nikola Lysenko, like Ethan has built like a full NDOA implementation that we have as part of uh, standard right now. Uh, but what remains to be done is that we need to have an engine for like performing uh, element-wise, access-wise operations. Yeah. And to have some like convenient broad broadcasting semantics like in, like in Python so that we can like just easily multiply like let's say all the elements of a matrix by a scalar number. Um, and so, so kind of related to that is also our efforts to, to the bindings of like linear algebra like LAPAC and BLAS routines. Um, to really allow for computa uh, efficient computation there. Maybe, Ethan, you want to uh, jump so, into that. So just a, or are you going to jump into blocks? No, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. What's your question? So, I mean, are, are, are you compiling BLOSS or are you writing a native implementation of BLOSS in JavaScript? <laughs> or what's the, uh, what does this mean exactly? <laughs> all the above. Okay. Um, all oh, the wow. above. So, uh, yeah, obviously, maybe the, the dirty secret of, of a lot of numerical computing languages is that under the hood, they're all using these um, C, C++, and Fortran libraries that were written in the 70s and 80s. And, and one of those is BLAST and also LAPAC. And so as part of any effort, uh, if you're doing any serious linear algebra development and numerical uh, code writing, you have to uh, write bindings for, for doing BLAST and LAPAC. So, um, we do, there's been an effort within the project to uh, write those bindings. Um, currently we do a lot of that by hand. I know in the, the Python community, they, and NumPy in particular, they managed to uh, do some F2 Python uh, transpilation. But for us, we've, we've been doing it by hand and there's a, there's a reason for that. And maybe it'll help if I actually show the structure of a, um, a native add-on for binding to BLAST. Yeah. So let me yeah, switch my... Please, please do. We also happen to have the uh, F2Pi author on the webinar right now. So <laughs> yeah, if, you, uh, if you want to ask any questions... Uh, I feel like I needed to give a shout out since I saw that he was on. Um, <laughs> yeah, let me pull up that tab. Right. So uh, this is a, a simple binding to the... Uh, level one routine, subroutine, and BLAST, a DAXPY, which works on double precision floating point vectors. And then the basic idea of it is that you multiply a vector X by a, a scalar. And then you want to add the result to another vector Y. So it's a pretty standard operation, particularly within linear algebra. And how we think about structuring these things is um, we have to provide um, native C bindings. So uh, in this particular repo, or sorry, in this particular folder, um, we have a, a canonical um, reference BLAST implementation. We also have a C BLAST wrapper such that if we want to be able to hook into um, hardware optimized libraries such as uh, Intel's MKL or um, Apple Accelerate or even OpenBLAST, uh, which we install through the project. Um, we have to have those wrappers and we also have to have a canonical fallback in order to compile to WebAssembly. Um, so this isn't gonna, actually, you're just gonna see raw code. So WebAssembly is a byte code format that allows you to transpile or compile native code and have it run on the web natively. And um, you need to have a canonical reference implementation to do this because uh, you don't have a hardware optimizations in the browser. You have a kind of like hardware um, 
neutral environment to compile these two. So you need to have a canonical reference implementation. And what do you mean then, by that exactly? Do you mean like a separate implementation that is just in pure JavaScript? Well, it, meaning like you need to follow like the canonical reference blast. So there's like reference blast, and then you have all these kind of like hardware optimized oh, uh, right, libraries such right, as right, open right. blast. Yeah. So you need, basically need to have both. You can't just try to compile over a hardware optimized version to WebAssembly. It's not really going to work for you. Right. Um, so you also need to have a reference blast implementation, which these things are already been done. Um, we do try to port them over to Fortran 95, so a little more modern version of Fortran. <laughs> And then finally, we we have like a native add-on wrapper for these things um, that basically does some argument munging and then actually calls down to your your C interface. Um, and then finally, for those environments, older browser environments which don't support WebAssembly, um, we also provide a JavaScript fallback, um, such that if you if you don't have like a hardware optimized implementation on your machine and you're you're working in an older Node.js version, um, then you can just call out to JavaScript. So there's actually quite a bit of code that has to be implemented in order to do these things. They're a little bit labor intensive. Um, but uh, the nice thing about it is you are able to reference and use Blast within browser environments of Node, and it gives you a lot of performance improvements. So the one of the things that we'd like to do is try to figure out how to either automate that process um, or if we need to continue manually doing these things, just continue scaling up that thing. So we have quite a bit of Blast so far implemented, but it's just a matter of getting the entire library implemented so that uh, we can build higher order functionality on top of that. Wow. So that's that. It's a huge undertaking. It, it is, it takes uh, many man hours. Um, so the next thing on the roadmap, so let me bring that back up. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that sounds like a place where there would be a lot of funding and contributions welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, because yeah. it opens, opens up new opportunities for doing not only um, computations in the in the browser for with WebAssembly or just in JavaScript, um, but it also allows for new types of applications in Node.js where you don't have a dual or, or triple language problem. You can just do a lot of these computations natively in JavaScript. So the next thing that's on our roadmap is um, data visualization. So actually, um, so one of the things about data visualization is everyone just kind of ask like, why, why build another data visualization library? Um, great and question. because there's like you know, D3, there's Vega, there's like a new data visualization library that comes out every day. Um, and the, the short answer to this is that many of these data visualization libraries are built with web browsers in mind first. And so there's a, there's a great emphasis on like interactivity and making like linked charts and basically the in deploy environment is a web browser. But very few, if any, developers have really thought about how you do, for example, server side rendering or what does a charting library in JavaScript look like when you're working in a REPL. And this is a bit different use case because the land of data visualization is not just like interactive charts, which kind of capture all, all the um, eyeballs, et cetera. But, you know, there's a lot of things where you're doing data visualization, um, where you're compiling or you're trying to generate static charts for report generation or just within normal data analysis workflows. And when you think about it from like a static rendering perspective, um, it allows you to approach the problem in a little bit different way. And that's what we've tried to do with the data visualization libraries that uh, we've built within standard lib because when you approach it from a server-side rendering perspective first and interactivity later it allows you to get serious performance improvements um, it's like two orders of magnitude 100x faster to do um, server-side static rendering compared to using d3js for example to generate a static chart so you can get a lot of performance advantages by doing static rendering server-side and as part of our our efforts to kind of like expand out our functionality is just once again, like different chart types or um, different backend engines to so be able to connect to not just like SVG generation, but token to Canvas in the browser, WebGL, or on the server to be able to do um, easy rendering to PNG and JPEG, et cetera. So there's just basically some functionality that we'd like to kind of build out a bit more um, with data visualization. Moving on to the third point here, so automation. We do have um, already quite a bit of tooling in place to, to support 
the project because it has been it's quite rather massive in scale and so we have really kind of invested a lot of effort into having like linting and other other uh, tooling to make sure that let's say all the readmes all the documentation is uh is in place that there are no errors in the example code there etc um but but there's still quite a few things to be done there as well so um previously mentioned that um the packages are built in a way that they are fully decomposable um so every function right in the library right now has their own package json file uh, they have all the uh, things needed to independently publish them but we haven't put, um I guess pulled that lever and some of the tooling is missing to automate the process of publishing the individual packages of the library to say npm so we really want to make it easier for people to to consume the project and to use it right um so that's that's a, a big piece there um and similar to that we also want to make it easier for people to contribute to the library um and to write their own implementations to write their own functions uh to be become a part of it and um so since we have quite a few pieces inside of a standard lib package, um, we want to build like a few more scaffolding tools that really can make it easier for people to get set up so that they have all the necessary boilerplate and can just focus on, on the implementations themselves. And then we have a few things here, like we want to work on browser testing and, uh, and we need to revisit our continuous uh, integration strategy. <laughs> That's mostly because like we, we have our like timeouts quite a bit on like the <laughs> services we use because like right now we run tests benchmarks for all the 3000 plus functions on there and um so that's a bit inefficient so what we want to do is that upon like a commit that we only um run the tests of of the changed packages or those packages that were affected um like intermediary by by those changes um so that's kind of a necessity that we just need to need to work on right. basically when like people like travis and circle like offer open source free open source uh, continuous integration they really didn't we're really having us in mind i don't think so um we certainly max out our uh continuous integration availability take a look at azure pipelines yeah yeah we've i looked into that initially um and i just haven't completed that that's still a work in progress but so far it's been really quite nice and of course the new stuff with GitHub. Um, yeah, with GitHub Actions, yeah. right? You, you have looked into that. So there's there's quite a, yeah, there's cool new stuff there too with that uh, you might want to yeah. incorporate and, and update. Cool. And stuff. The other thing, um, before you go too far, um, I was thinking, have you guys talked to like Michael at Pyodide or Matic and Monk who worked on YT with some of the WebAssembly um, visualization stuff? It'd probably be a good conversation to have. Yeah, I'm certainly, we're both certainly aware of, of Pyodide and the work that the, the folks at Mozilla are, are working on. And certainly it's, it's, it's quite impressive um, what they've been able to achieve and, and certainly be able to get NumPy and SciPy running natively in a browser. What I will say about that is that it's kind of a different, a little bit different model. So in order to run that code, you have to essentially also load an entire Python interpreter. Um, right which is really quite heavyweight. And so you're not really gonna be able to use that within a normal web application. Mozilla has talked about uh, releasing a Firefox extension that um, loads in the Python interpreter compiled to WebAssembly um, kind of built in, um, which is which is great, but then you need to have a plugin. So now you're back to Java applets kind of thing. Um, and another thing about it is it's really hard to decompose, for example, NumPy and SciPy down to their individual components. Um, so let's say you just need the error function or you need some special function out of um, out of SciPy, et cetera. You basically end up having to load all of NumPy and SciPy in your application to be able to use that one particular thing. Um, so there's some constraints within the web that make that approach a little bit difficult. Um, not that it won't be viable in the long term, but I think there's a lot more work in R&D that has to be done in order to make that truly viable for web applications. Yeah, I, I think what the point I was trying to get at was not so much using Pyodide, but right. to uh, start further your discussions yeah, with definitely. The web assembly folks. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, because this is really cool stuff, and um, and and Madigan, um I think she took a very similar approach, but she just used Rust to uh, right. do the compilation stuff or transpilation. 
Yeah, in fact, um, I think when they they wrote up a blog on the on, on Mozilla and they actually referenced standard lib. So they're aware of us, we're aware of them. We just haven't actually had a conversation. Yeah, we didn't have any any we didn't reach out yet. So but I guess Wait. we should do it. I mean it's also like uh WebAssembly is kind of a is a moving target, but it has been in like developing quite a bit since yeah. since when we yeah. started using it. it. So like being aware of where they're headed and stuff would certainly be yeah. good for us. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so and then the the last piece there is just that um, we have uh, we want to well we have a lot of documentation for like the individual live uh, packages and stuff right so we have everything there, but um, one piece of the upcoming roadmap will be to just raise the public profile of the library through uh, like better documentation that makes it easy for people to get started in a sense. So we want to have like some tutorials, like blog posts, like common use cases, um, maybe some video tutorials, just to make it easy for people to pick up the library because it is rather big and uh, maybe a bit, uh, yeah, not that easy to get into right now. So um, yeah, that's also something, I guess, if people are interested in contributing, right, that uh, would be a good place to start. And we do have some, some cool stuff also planned. We just recently tweeted our docs and our documentation on the website. And we have some plans of making the source code browsable like directly on there. With some nice features like having like with uh, including the JS doc annotations and so that you really can peek under the hood and, and look through all the implementations in a nice way. Um, we also need to finish the TypeScript definitions. So we have them for a good chunk of the library, like I think 73% or something like that, but not everything yet. Um, but it's, it seems to be a worthwhile goal because certainly like TypeScript has become very popular for like building these large uh, web applications. Um, but suffers from the same issue in JavaScript in terms of it doesn't have a standard library, right? So, and we want to serve uh, the TypeScript community there as well, and I think um, can equip them with the tools they need for their work. Yeah, that's awesome. These are all really exciting directions to be heading in. So, uh, yeah, I, I think just to reemphasize that point that if you're interested in contributing, there's a lot of surface area here that you could contribute on. And uh, same same with funding. So if you're interested in funding uh, the standard lib project in any of these various uh, dimensions, I think, yeah, it would yeah. Be, there, there's a lot of places the project could go and, and should go. So that's exciting. Um, and you've done a ton of work so far uh, at this <laughs> point as well. Yeah. Yeah. So at this point, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. And, and you know, for those of you who are watching live right now, if you want to get some last second questions in as well, feel free to post those. And so our first question comes from Hamir, uh, who asks, uh, what do you use to write WebAssembly other than C, C++, and Fortran? Yeah, so uh, in order to generate WebAssembly output, the only languages that we write in are C and C++. Um, so Fortran is simply to have Fortran bindings um, for native add-ons to hook into uh, hardware optimized libraries. Whenever we compile to WebAssembly, we're strictly compiling from uh, C implementations. So we're not doing anything with like Rust or Go, which are two other more common um, languages to compile onto WebAssembly. It's strictly C. Very cool. Cool. Um, we've also got another question from Perry. How the performance of how does the performance of standard lib functions compare to equivalent functions in NumPy slash SciPy, assuming that the computations are run on the same machine? Yeah. So I guess I can also answer this. Um, if, if you want, you can run all the benchmarks yourself. In fact, um, there's a there's a make file command when you pull down the the repo um, that allows you to run all the cross language benchmarks uh, for each of the, for example, special math functions, etc. What we find in general with, with performance is that um, if you do like strictly native JavaScript, you can get pretty close to Python performance. So calling to NumPy and SciPy. Um, implementations. As soon as you start using hardware optimized libraries, so for example, if you want to do some linear algebra, uh, what we find is that, for example, Node.js native add-ons can often ex be a little bit faster than NumPy, SciPy. The, when we look at the cross-language comparison, the one that's really, really slow is R, which probably isn't <laughs> a surprise. Um, 
And the one that kind of blows a lot of us out of the water and a lot of things, not all, um, is Julia. Julia seems yeah. to be faster across the board for many things. Um, but certainly when we look at uh, JavaScript versus NumPy, SciPy, we see equivalent performance. If not, I would say a little bit faster in, in JavaScript and Node.js native add-ons, um, simply because it seems like it seems that the overhead calling from a JavaScript runtime into the native layer uh, is a, has a little bit less overhead. But it varies from function to function. Some things NumPy and SciPy is faster, and other places we're a bit faster. At some point, we'll we'll actually uh, generate some reports and publish them on the website. Um, but it's just you know we're a little bit short on man hours at the present moment. <laughs> fantastic stuff. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Are there any last second questions here? I don't uh, don't see that any have come in, so I think we can. I have a question. Oh, Carol, Ooh. by all means. So, say I wanted to use standard lib, and yep. I'm approaching it from the first for the first time, and and one of the things I find compelling are some of the mathematical things that you've done. Yep. How would I get started to do that? So we have like browser bundles that are part of the library. So for mm -hmm. example, like for if you're interested in the special math functions, we have a specific bundle for that as well. So that you can just use the script, put a script tag on your HTML page and then mm -hmm. can use them directly. Um, to, to We have also tooling to generate custom bundles that you need that um, um, it's a bit harder to find right now. So we're working on that, but we also have like a Gitter channel and some other uh, ways where people can ask questions and um, yeah, F and yes. Yeah, and if you're basically using Node.js, which if you're using for oh. any kind of application development now, all you need to do is npm install at standard lib slash standard lib. Right. And, yeah, that's what I was And then you can use it, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And, and if also, um, if you install that globally, um, then you have exposed the standard libs DLI, um, which mm -hmm. gives you all these uh, command line utilities. So if you want to do like random number generation for piping into your favorite uh, charting library, um, you can do that. And I'm assuming I could just install whichever part of the math. Like if I all I wanted was math. Ooh, yeah, that's 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 the part that uh, Philip was talking about in terms of decomposability. So be okay. able to uh, install each of the individual components, even namespaces. That's still very much a work in progress. Like we have a lot of the infrastructure to do that, but we have not pulled the trigger in terms of publishing each of the individual component and namespaces. But once we do that, then then yeah, then you'll be able to you'll be able to npm install just the particular namespace or just the particular functions that you're using. That would be a cool thing for funding, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> definitely would be very <laughs> great for funding. So if there are funders out there that want to help support that, we'd very much appreciate it. That's Thanks awesome. for your responses. Okay, so Anthony. Hamir has snuck in one more question here <laughs> under the wire. Um, furiously typing as I believe he does. Uh, can you use the native extensions in the browser and not in Node? Uh, so Node.js native add-ons you can only use in Node because you're actually extending the Node.js runtime. Um, the only thing you can run natively in the browser is going to be uh, a, a statically compiled language that's been compiled to WebAssembly. So once you get in WebAssembly, then you can run it in the browser. But there's just some additional caveats associated with that because then you need to do manual memory management, et cetera. And that can get a bit hairy um, because the story for WebAssembly modules sharing memory and talking to each other is still evolving. Um, <laughs> so to put it mildly. And so um, at the present moment, if you want to use like hardware optimized blast libraries or native add-ons, you can only use that, do that in Node. Um, but if you want to use WebAssembly, to get near native performance, then you need to actually use uh, native code, statically compiled code that's been compiled to WebAssembly. Great answer. So at yeah, this awesome. point, we are going to move on to our world famous rant or rave section, where we each get 15 seconds to rant or rave about a, any topic that we uh, we choose. Philip, I believe it is your soapbox first here today. Uh, okay, I just want to say like web development is very painful at times. I had like <laughs> the other day like issues. I had like, so, like things didn't work on Safari and like we had to fix that. And then like the whole tech stack, like with like Webpack and all the the tooling that you just need to get started, right? Is uh, is kind of too much. So like yeah, making that easier would be good. <laughs> Athens. <laughs> so I'm going to say something rather controversial, I suppose. Um, 
particularly within the Jupyter community, uh, is that I think TypeScript is overhyped and, uh, and too often abused. And more generally, I think modern JavaScript language features are overhyped and too often abused. And I think in general, the more your code looks like C, um, the better your performance and the more consistent that performance will be. Uh, I love it. And uh, I'm going to follow up with that and say, dependencies that try to make working and accessing data and models easier and using them, but enough that they actually make the code more complicated. So, um, <laughs> you know, please just use Alembic and SQL Alchemy and forget all the other million packages around it. And that is my rant. <laughs> uh, I'm going to switch from the, the code woes here. And, uh, <laughs> oh, no, uh, not again. <laughs> today, um, I'd like to rant against the illegal, immoral, and disrespectful behavior of people driving their cars in the bike lane and on the sidewalk. Philadelphia. On the sidewalk? On the sidewalk. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. This morning was not good. Uh, Got to get a hold of yourself, Philadelphia. It's just totally unacceptable. Uh, San Francisco also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone just, I also for your city there. Uh, yeah. That is all the time that we have for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. You can find us on Twitter at Quonsite AI if you're interested in funding open source project, including Standard Lib, uh, which has a lot of surface area. Um, you can find all of the project roadmaps on quads at quonsite.com slash projects. Uh, Philip and Athen, where can people find you and Standard Lab? So they can find us both on Twitter. So there's a K Gride for Athen and like I'm book cap. Like on there, we have our like the website, standardlib.io. Uh, we also have uh, like a GitHub channel uh, for the project where people can ask questions and uh, we're always there to help out. Um, we also have the GitHub, obviously, like uh, standardlibjs slash standardlib. Um, and the project itself also has a Twitter account. So that's uh, you can follow StandardLibJS on Twitter. Is, did I forget anything, Evan? I think that's it. OK. Great. Well, I'm not Matplot fibbing this time, so, but so <laughs> join us again next episode <laughs> for our discussion on Matplotlib. Knock on wood. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. <laughs>